Hello and welcome to Teaching English with the British Council Series 2. A podcast in which we try and provide solutions to some of the key questions being asked by English teachers around the world. Teaching English with the British Council. We are your hosts, we am Hamdan and Chris Salton. In each episode, we address one such question and attempt to answer it in two ways. Teaching English with the British Council. In the first part of each episode, we hear from a British Council project, program or publication about something which is being done to address this issue. Across the 10 episodes of Series 2, we'll hear from teachers, trainers and researchers in a wide range of contexts, including Ukraine, Romania, Egypt and the United Kingdom. Teaching English with the British Council. In the second part, a leading English expert and practitioner will provide practical solutions which you can immediately try out wherever you work. Each episode of Teaching English is accompanied by a full transcript and show notes. These show notes provide additional information, a glossary of keywords, and links to relevant websites. Teaching English with the British Council This is Episode 8. What is English for Specific Purposes and how is it different from General English? Welcome to episode 8 of Teaching English Podcast and in this episode we will talk about what is English for specific purposes and how is it different from general English. Would you be able to answer this question, Chris? The thing that really struck me in researching this episode is just how big the field of English for specific purposes are. There's the main areas which we may know about, things like English for law, business English, English for oil, gas and petrochemicals, that sort of thing. Then there's less well-known areas like English for tourism, environmental English, English for fashion, and then English for specific purposes really aimed at particular jobs. So things like English for waiters, English for air traffic controllers, or English for engineers. So it was really interesting because I think ESP covers so much ground and it's really almost an indicator of where the English language ecosystem is at. And to learn more about English for specific purposes, we will talk to Viviana Cortes, Editor-in-Chief for English for Specific Purposes Journal. So Viviana, for our listeners who may be unfamiliar with the term English for Specific Purposes, could you say a little about what it is? Whenever there is a need, okay, there is going to be a reason for a specific curriculum. And it's not only ESP. These days, it's language for specific purposes. And in fact, the idea is that ESP is an approach to language teaching that targets the needs of the learners. It centers on the language and skills necessary to meet those needs. So English for specific purposes still has the needs analysis as the essence of the curriculum design. But I also believe that ESP has evolved. And nowadays, even though the needs continue to be essential and guide the curriculum design, many stakeholders contribute. As you said, many stakeholders are being involved in the development of English for specific purposes. Are there any disadvantages of that, of including maybe non-educators in the design and development of these products? You include as many stakeholders as possible because when you triangulate data from different sources, you get better results before you start designing or while you are designing. Sometimes, let's be realistic, you design while you are teaching, okay? Because, I mean, sometimes you have to design your needs analysis and implement it the first week of classes. I also believe that something that is very important in ESP is that there is a continuous evaluation of the course or the program. I think, Viviana, that ESP compared to general English is perhaps a bit more dynamic because it has to respond to those changes, whether it's in medical English, aviation English, legal English, whatever it may be, that it is 
function focused it is absolutely more function focused because you have this need that needs to be met in many cases in a a fixed period of time and could you perhaps uh, viviana just outline some of the um sort of general fields within esp oh yeah i mean if there is a need <laughs> there is going to be a context to explore okay so of course we always think of english for academic purposes and english for occupational and professional purposes we can think of medical english legal english english for nurses english for tourism Could you say a little bit, uh, Viviana, maybe about the the different pedagogical approaches that might be used within these different fields? Because on the one hand, you've got English for Islamic studies, English for the police, English for energy. Is there a universal pedagogical approach that is used or is there very much difference between those different areas? I believe that the materials are usually authentic materials that come from the area from the context and the techniques and teaching procedures usually imitate activities that are performed in those contexts what do you advise learners who are not sure whether to learn general english or english for specific purposes I think that many learners don't know what learner English for specific purposes is, okay? I think that it's usually the other way around. It's like an, an administrator or a curriculum designer or an instructor that is called because there is a need, there is a group of learners that need this particular skill or this particular purpose. But I think that when a learner has a very specific need, for their English, that is when ESP has to come into play. And do you see it growing into the future ESP with certainly through uh, online courses and so on, and perhaps through things like um, what we've learned after the COVID pandemic and so on, the importance of medical English or medical other languages as well, and the interaction between those different languages to understand the different terms or how they translate differently and all these sorts of things. I mean, do you, do you see the field is a, is a fluid one, is a changing one or, or one that will increase into the future? The first thing that we see these days is that there is much more interest in speaking needs because now it's much easier to collect data, to collect the spoken data and analyze spoken data. So you can identify trends in spoken registers that then you can transfer to the classroom. And there, there's a lot of interest in, for example, uh, oral presentations in academics to prepare for those but also service encounters. So then there's more opportunity to analyze those genres. And so that can transfer into materials and teaching practices. Also, the study of English as a lingua franca in areas that are not business English, because business English has been looking at English as a lingua franca for a long time, particularly If we think of contexts in which English didn't used to play a dominant role, for example, the role of English in Polish universities these days, or for example, the need of francophone doctors to use English for conferences, conference travel, but also for doctor-patient interaction in cases in which English is the lingua franca. And again, things like that becoming even more niche. Absolutely, because, I mean, it's not like one size fits all. Uh, in ESP, the S is the specificity. The context is going to be very important, and it's going to call for tailor-made curricula. And okay. I guess things like Web 3.0 and things like that are going to help to facilitate that potentially as well. I think so, but I can see that in the future. Another thing that is having a lot of attention these days is multimodal discourse analysis. Also, the how to exploit social media in ESP. We have seen a couple of recent articles on the use of Twitter for English for specific purposes in, in different areas. So that is also a part of the new trends. And Sometimes it can be a response to a crisis in a country. For example, unemployment for youth. The British Council created a course called English for Digital Freelancers to enable young people 
to find jobs on digital platforms. Because they identify the need. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's the most important thing. I think that I'm going to tell you something that sounds a bit silly, but I think that we do need analysis for absolutely everything that we do in our lives. Okay, so it's like you, you're going to go grocery shopping, you do like a shopping list. That's your needs analysis. So I really don't understand how English language programs do not base their curriculum design on needs analysis. Okay, so I think that it doesn't matter if it's specific or general, there should be a needs analysis that considers the stakeholders and the needs of the students. Viviana, do you think then that there will be a turn away from global course books, international exams like TOEFL or IELTS and so on, those sort of very general approach? Oh. No, no, you're shaking your head. <laughs> I mean, of course, those standardized tests don't meet the needs for assessment in ESP. But uh, assessment in ESP is always a topic of discussion because it's like an ongoing discussion, how we can better assess the English in the workplace. And there are many good examples, okay, but uh, it's troublesome. Where is the, the line between content and language, okay? And we have been discussing that for a long, long time. Um, and I don't think there is like a definite answer for that. I think that both things need to be considered at the same time. So I think that the standardized tests are here to stay, okay? They are not going to leave. And unfortunately, I can see a lot of ignorance in many administrations in which they really don't reflect on the fact of what those tests are really testing. So what different pathways are there for English teachers who are interested in working in more specialist fields? I think that the first thing that teachers need to become acquainted with is the process of curriculum design and the different elements of the language curriculum, particularly become very well acquainted with needs analysis, okay, so how to design a needs analysis and how to implement a needs analysis. Because once you do that, and you see how easy it is to go from those results to the design of goals, objectives, and learning outcomes for your specific context, then you realize that it makes a lot of sense, okay, to follow that procedure. When uh, working on a very specialized context, I think that it's fundamental, it's essential to um, get in touch with specialists in the area, okay, Uh, professionals in the area, um, workers in the area, Uh, because these can become informants for your, the design of your curriculum at all levels of the curriculum, from the needs analysis to deciding on the materials or how you are going to teach or what you are going to teach, and probably ideas on how to assess your students in that particular context. I think one interesting thing about that is, in my experience of teaching English for academic purposes, some academics were very useful in terms of informing on that sort of content. Others, though, had a view of the language, which was, I think, different to the present reality of the language which was being used. So I yeah, I think it's choosing the right person, isn't it? Or kind of that, that sure is it also is. important. That is also important, choosing the right person. But I'm mostly not always not working with only one person because when you have different people, you can compare and contrast what people are telling you. But it is fundamental, okay, to talk to people that are experts in a field. One of my students did a study of medical discourse a couple of years ago. And she had some expert informants that were essential for us because in many cases we couldn't make heads or tails out of the expression we were working with. Okay, it's just like we could understand the meaning of the words in isolation, but when they were all together, we didn't know what they meant. And we were reading texts in which the expression appeared a lot of times. But if we hadn't had a doctor, a couple of doctors, in fact, uh, who explained what those meant to us, we would be still trying to finish that study because it was impossible for us. So, I mean, and and that's just a simple example. Brilliant. Viviana, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fascinating. No problem. So many of our listeners, Wayam, are not English for specific purposes teachers, but are there things that they can do 
to introduce some of those ideas in their classrooms? Um, it's very helpful to tell the students about it at the very beginning, maybe uh, if they are at a lower level, you can explain to them what is English for specific purposes and how they can use it to become more functional in their field of work. So they don't necessarily have to take a course in English for specific purposes, but they can learn about it. And I'm, I think people coming from higher education background, so fresh graduates will know the terms that are specific for their field, but they just need sort of a push on how to use these terms in the right context. So just a signposting or explaining to them at the beginning of the course can be motivating for them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think when students get to a certain level, they might think, well, why am I just learning more and more English? And they want to think, well, what am I actually going to do with this English? And I think having more awareness about ESP at that stage can be can be really, really beneficial. And uh, then it feels like there's a real value in, in using their English in that way. I think it works. Like, for example, if you want to improve the dialogue, interfaith dialogue between, let's say, if someone does a course on Islamic studies and they want to develop interfaith, you know, conversation between Muslims, Christians, and let's say Jews or other people from other faiths it's a good way to know you know the specificities of certain terms that can be a vehicle for that conversation but you sort of need the base for it yeah I think it can be really useful for those sort of more contentious areas or areas where if you say the wrong thing or you go down the wrong line or you're using the wrong words whatever it may be can lead to accidental offense or problems so I think it can be sort of very useful in those sorts of areas Yes, and also not sometimes it's not just conversation, it can be also written language. I've seen some students wanting to improve their CV writing and they want to write a nice bio on LinkedIn to be able to find jobs. So teaching them certain language that can, you know, be the vehicle for that can be very useful for them. In this episode from the field, we hear from a range of different experts in ESP specialities about the features and interesting components of their area of work. Teaching English with the British Council. My name is Dominique Estival and I'm working on Aviation English. I've been working on this for 14, 15 years now. I'm a linguist and because I'm also a pilot, I've been working on aviation communication and especially how it's taught because I'm also a flight instructor. People think that English is the international language of aviation. It's not actually the case, but it's very codified. It's very structured. One of the most important things is the pronunciation, that aviation English is actually codified so that we try to avoid ambiguity as much as possible. So one feature of aviation English is that you don't say three or uh, five or nine for the numbers, you say three, five and nine up so that it's actually distinguishable. So that's uh, one of the one of the big differences. People learn how to speak on the radio by while they're flying. So it's not the best way. And we, we teach them, you know, the basic principles. But the most important thing is not so much the lexical items or the pronunciation, but it's the, the way the conversation goes. Because one of the important things in aviation is that we speak over the radio and it's not like the telephone or the radio. If you have two speakers, transmitting at the same time, nobody hears anything. It's completely scrambled. So the turn taking in the conversation is very structured. Most people would be aware that, you know, we, we give call signs. So we would say something like Sydney traffic, and then you finish with your own call sign, which would be blue 543, for instance. That's the way of indicating that you're starting a new transmission and who you're talking to. You indicate that you finish your transmission by giving basically your name. And one of the things that the most uh, difficult to teach student pilots is to actually learn to listen on the radio 
so that they figure out when it's their turn to speak. And it's very intimidating because if you make a mistake, everybody else on the frequency hears you and it's high pressure and high stakes. There's a lot of information that comes very quickly. The other thing about aviation communication is that we drop a lot of the grammatical words. So we don't use the prepositions, especially not the prepositions for and to in front of numbers. There have been cases of uh, incidents where for four two thousand was interpreted as for two thousand rather than the preposition for. I should say it's very fixed. So you have a manual, you have circulars and standard list of phraseology that people have to use. From time to time, there is an update or something has changed, usually because there will have been an incident. When an incident happens or when, you know, some ambiguity comes to the fore and people notice it, then the phraseology will be updated. That's not often at all. It does evolve, but not extremely quickly. So I'm Chris Moore, founder and managing director of Specialist Language Courses. We work in medical English in particular, working with educational institutions, but also healthcare employers around the world. So medical English is, is a rapidly growing base in the sense that healthcare is a very internationalized world and English is really the lingua franca. During the pandemic, that kind of internationalization really accelerated because research, news, drug therapies, everything was being done in English. The language itself reflects the technical side of healthcare. So in terms of symptoms, diagnoses, treatments. So, you know, the vocabulary is very much, is very common among healthcare professionals, but not so common among us as, as language teachers. So our teachers have to really get to understand the space quite quickly when they're working with healthcare, both students and, and professionals. So the world of medical terminology is, is a very big one. In terms of the way that language is used, clinical communication does have its own demands. So if you're a doctor or a nurse and you're working with patients and their families, the kind of stresses that you're under in order to deliver what can be very difficult news in a way that lands right, it's very difficult for a first language speaker, let alone if you're doing it in another language. If we look at the kind of global healthcare workforce, you can see how mobile it is. So if you go to any hospital in, in London, for example, there are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, you, know, you name it, from every corner of the world. And they're all working in English and they're all communicating in English on quite complex subjects in quite high stress, high stakes situations. And therefore, they need the language to do that the language and the communication skills. So communication skills in the sense of, of, of giving information or gathering information or eliciting information, whatever it happens to be, is also a fundamental part of medical English. So a lot of the work that we do is around that kind of sort of functional side of language, as well as teaching grammar and the kind of building blocks of vocabulary and so on. I mean, grammar is an interesting one. I mean, you know, the, the, there's a, a, a real need for accurate grammar when you're working in healthcare. So, you know, writing a piece of research, you, you know, you, you've got to get it right. It's a very high level piece of work. And to do it in English, in, if it's your second language, is, is hard. So we, we build in that kind of thing. So grammar, academic English, but very much within a healthcare context. And so you've got to look at what's happening in those spaces. And that's got to be then reflected into the lessons. So the teachers that we work with, most of them do not have a medical background. I mean, a small number do. So ex-nurses, you know, ex-doctors, and that's great. Uh, but those that don't really have to kind of get under the skin of the subject. And that has its challenges. And so we find that the English teachers who work with us stick with us. You know, they really enjoy the, the work that they do. But it does take a while to get, you know, on top of the language and to understand the kind of again if we come back to clinical communication to to understand the scenarios that their students are are working in and if you're a pharmacist it's going to be different to being a nurse going to be different to being a, a doctor going to be different to being a, a gp or a consultant so you know it is important to to get under the the skin of that and we spend quite a lot of time working with our teachers in order to support them uh to to do so my name is Amna. I taught a course on ESP to MA students. 
and also supervise some of my students' research on different ESP topics. I also wrote a book on English for Islamic studies. The book is not only targeting students who study Islamic studies, but also people who work in the field, like imams who work in English-speaking countries and need to use English to address their congregation or audience. So the book contained language which people, these people need to use, conversational language, and also some grammar items that they need to use for speaking and for writing. The book uh, English for Islamic Studies also contains a glossary with some of the most important terms that people need to use in speaking about Islam and uh, their meaning. First, we translated the terms and then we explained the words. The problem was that some of these words don't have English equivalent. So uh, we had to use the same word, words like zakat, for example. Uh, it doesn't have uh, an equivalent, but we explained the meaning of the word. And these words are used in the book. Or the book has text, and the text uh, discuss different topics related to Islam. And we use these terms and these words in these texts. And there is a lot of vocabulary work in the book as well. English for specific purposes, as we have seen in the report, can offer a structured way for learners to learn a language in different fields. It can be for healthcare workers, for imams, as we have seen, in aviation. And it could be as an easy way for learners to look at things or to learn because it offers the functional side of language as opposed to maybe the grammar or the lexical side of language. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I think that was a really interesting point that came out that what came through in those short extracts was about the codification, the scripts, the functions, the reasons for using those particular words or those particular grammatical structures. I think one other thing that really kind of I thought about there was how difficult it must be for students of English for specific purposes to move between those different registers because you know they can't talk like an air traffic controller in their everyday lives but also when they're working as an air traffic controller they can't use general English as well so they really have to move between those different areas and I think that can be quite challenging and quite demanding for students but also quite demanding for teachers as well. Yeah, and I think for professionals who don't have enough time maybe to study a language from A to Z, it offers maybe a shortcut for them because they already have the knowledge in, you know, they have the vocabulary and expert knowledge in the field. So they just need those functional phrases to make it more communicative for the audience. In my experience, I've seen lots of of professionals, for example, sometimes doctors, enrolling in general English courses, which can be sometimes time-consuming for health workers. So going to English for specific purposes, I think they are given just a platform or the space to use that language in a setting that they think is most useful. And I think it can be more motivating as well as, as a result, because as you say, if a doctor goes to a general ELT course, they might think after a few sessions, well, why am I here? What's the point of me doing here I'm not learning anything that I need for the work that I'm doing so it can help with that sort of validity of the course for particular users because they see from the very start from lesson one the reason for why they're learning this particular type of English Thank you for listening to episode 8 of Teaching English with the British Council. In our next episode, we look at how the ELT sector can become fairer for all teachers. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Teaching English with the British Council Series 2 is hosted by Wiam Hamdan and Chris Souten. The producer is Elizabeth Dyer. Executive producer, Chris Dyer. Salsan Abu Kara is the Arabic language consultant. That's one strategy, but do you have any other strategies that learners can use, Chris? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. <laughs>
that's our outtake. Yeah. <laughs> Before we go, we'd like to draw your attention to our listener feedback survey. Tell us what you think of the podcast, any improvements we could make, or any topics or themes of teaching English that you would like us to include in future episodes. A link to the survey is available in the show notes and on the British Council website. Teaching English with the British Council.